our devices, and it's being chaired by fantastic Kathy White from Eat Girls. Thanks, love. Um, so I'm just going to pass over to her, I think. Um, if anybody um, does want to be in the other room, then it's too late. You're in here. So we Shut might get the them in here. This is an important discussion. So yeah, enjoy it. Thank you, Megan. All right, so hello everyone, and uh, welcome to the first panel of the day. So we're going to be looking at mental health, well-being, and our devices. Now, one of the things that's kind of very key to Geek Girl, aside from the diversity piece, is we actually kind of like to break down typical taboos. So you'll notice that on the agenda today, we're talking about mental health, and we're talking about sex tech, two of my favourite topics. <laughs> um, so I'm, I'm really delighted to be moderating the, uh, the mental health and well-being panel, because it's something that I really, really advocate being open about. Uh, on that note, I'd like to welcome our three lovely panellists, um, Lizzie, Nancy and Sawyer. And, and what I would love for each of you to do, I'm going to start with Lizzie, because you, you've made eye contact now, that's the worst thing to do in this panel conversation. Um, I would love it, Lizzie, if you can start by introducing yourself and tell us a little bit about Bright Mind. Sure. Um, so my name is Lizzie, uh, Lizzie Barkley. I'm the founder of an app called Bright Mind. It's an app for recording, reflecting, and sharing honest emotions for better mental clarity. Um, it launched in July this year following a, um, a long period I spent volunteering with the Samaritan's Charity. Ooh. The Samaritan's Charity is one of their listeners, um, although since then it's evolved very much um, into a mainstream product um, following the same principles of um, taking time out of your day to offload honestly. Um, even with yourself about your emotions, um, but also to have those emotions played back to you in different ways so that you can start to spot patterns in your feelings and behaviour. Um, we've also recently branched into the physical world and run workshops on self-reflection. Fantastic. Nancy. Um, hi, I like this song. <laughs> <laughs> hi, I'm Nancy Begney. Um, I am the founder of the Inspire Movement. The Inspire Movement is a group of individuals who believe in the power of positive thinking and sharing our stories with one another. Um, we believe that in today's world, we're all very attached to our electronic devices and not being able to be our true authentic self. And so we started this movement in hopes to remind ourselves what we what, what is true to who we are. And um, we host events around London. We're launching in New York and San Francisco um, later this year and early next year. We also have a, um, we're using Facebook as a private forum to, to interact and share inspirational stories, moments, pictures with each other. Um, and I would love to add you guys, if you're interested, just add me on Facebook and uh, shoot me a message and um, I'll, I'll engage with you guys about what we're doing and add you to the um, invite list too. Awesome, I love that, the open invitation already. Everyone's welcome. I'm so good. Yes, hello, my name is Zulia, and um, I'm a psychologist and founder of an application called PsychApps. Well, the company is called PsychApps, and it is a digital mental health application that helps screen for depression, helps psycho educate you about like what's happening in your life with depression, what can I expect, how long does it take, am I alone or not, and um, guides you to self-help. It's evidence-based, so by using the application, it actually significantly lowers depression level and guides you to therapeutic help in your vicinity to specialists that are specialized on your personality type and your needs. <laughs> Brilliant. So I'm going to start by throwing a question out to you guys actually in the room and seeing who feels a little bit brave this morning. Who here has ever had, let's just call it negative mental health because there's so many different types. Okay, that's quite a lot. Who here needs a little bit of cheering up? <laughs> okay, cool. Um, so uh, I suffer full blown from depression and anxiety. I've suffered with it for many, many years, and, and that's why I'm really, really open to talking about it, because I actually think that by talking about it, you can make it a lot better. Um, one of the things that I want to start with, because uh, the idea with the way we're wired is we're looking at how technology is changing us and how we're changing technology and shaping the future. So why don't we start at the negative, and then we will grow towards the lovely positive. So how have we seen technology impact us and impact our mental health? And I Sylvia, when we were talking on email, you mentioned a couple of things that you wanted to highlight. So maybe you can begin by talking about the ways in which we're seeing technology have a negative impact on our mental health. 
Um, okay, negative, but I think it was great just like almost everybody raised their hands and we're all humans and we've all been through shitty times and it's a beautiful sign that we're raising our hands, we're talking about it, we're being open about it and that lowers stigma and that allows people to get help faster and better. So this is amazing. This is one of the things that I'm fighting with my application. So kudos to you guys. Kudos to you. Thank you. Um, well, I have been looking at um, two things mostly, and the first thing is negative body image in young women, and that can lead to all kinds of things, depression as well, eating um, disorders and social anxieties. And um, one of my pet peeves right now is porn and internet porn addiction, which has a huge impact on our children or our teenagers. Starts as early as 10, 11 with boys, and it has a big impact mostly on young boys but on girls as well and of course the girls that are interacting with the young boys so I think that probably this could be one of the biggest new waves of problems that is coming our way into the new generations. Okay, that's interesting. I know that with um, porn for instance you have got companies out there that are trying to educate people about what real sex is and Later today, we will have a sex pet panel, I'm sure that they will deep dive into this stuff because you've got um, Cindy Gallup with Make Love Not Porn trying to kind of emphasize what real world sex is and how awesome it is. Um, <laughs> sorry, side note. <laughs> yeah, light in the room a little bit. Um, Lizzie, you mentioned that obviously you kind of came up with the idea of Bright Mind when you were working with the Samaritans. When you were volunteering there, were you aware of people getting in touch with uh, kind of issues that were coming out of use of tech? So it could be social media or, or anything else. Yeah, that, that, I mean that was one of the main inspirations for building the app. Um, and, and actually, what was interesting was how people weren't making the connection. People were talking about problems that were so clearly related to technology, like for example, overuse of social media, even just down to things like being absolutely exhausted or checking your phone ten times throughout the night because. You know, people joke about things like FOMO, but it's actually you know, quite a real issue, especially for young people who feel so panicked because their self-esteem tends to be lower than, than adults, um, that if they're missing out on something. So even just down to people not, not handling their emotions well through lack of sleep, um, that, you know, that if, you're, if you're tired, you're not going to be as resilient emotionally as you are when you are well rested. Um, so even, even things like that have a massive impact. Um, but what struck me the most was the lack of awareness. People were just like, you know, surprised almost um, if it was suggested that it could be something to do with technology. Um, and I think that's because people love their technology so much because it's used for so many positive things as well. That it's actually quite a hard thing to accept that maybe there are negatives as well as the positives. Yeah, it's kind of the, the mobile phone is effectively the remote control of life Yeah. now. Um, and I think sometimes when you look at social media, you know, everyone puts their best foot forward really, yeah, kind of makes you want to fast forward through your own remote control and try and get there, which can have a bit of a negative play. Yeah. Um, Nancy, I'd love to know more about the Inspire Movement story and why you started it, but I also wondered if you would like to kind of think about what someone should be doing if they are having negative thoughts and, and you know, why we formed the Inspire Movement and what kind of the ambition is, because I think it's got a really lovely story to it. Okay. So that, then, I, then I won't do the founder story later. No, you can, can do the sh <laughs> short one. Yeah, 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 okay. And I also, I actually do have a note that I want to make about the technology, but I'll, I can tell the story yeah, just this a bit. Okay. Um, so I started the Inspire Movement um, as a passion project back in May. Um, I launched with Google. We partnered with them for the launch and hosted 200 people in the room. And the idea, the reason behind it, the driver behind it was that um, my someone very close to me last summer had been diagnosed with cancer and went into a dark place and in order to kind of jolt them out of it i shared something with that person that i hadn't told more than two people um, which was that i had been severely depressed at university and there were weeks where i didn't even leave my flat my apartment um i didn't go outside i didn't brush my teeth i didn't shower i just was completely gone and someone came in um literally broke into my apartment and I think that person said it saved my life in a way. So I, I shared that with um, the other individual and it helped him a lot. That one story set him on a path that forced him to do a 180. So he went from being very sad, depressed, to being one of the most happy, optimistic people in my life now. 
And I realized how important it is that we break down those barriers and actually just are open with each other about the struggles that we face. Um, so I got together with some friends, decided to put together this one event that was going to be tiny. And it started in November of last year. And by April of the following year, it had somehow gone from a 50 person tiny event to having this incredible advisor, advisory board of some of the most influential people in the tech ecosystem here, having a co-founder, having a team of 10 volunteers being hosted at Google, partnered with Google, it just it exploded. And that, to me, was a real sign that people care about this and people want this. And this is a real problem in our, in our, in our society right now, that we're all tied up in work and technology and don't have an outlet for being true to who we are and being our authentic self and taking off the armor that we wear every day and just being real. So um, that's why this past July I decided to, to do it full time and uh, quit my VC job and actually just be a founder again and build something that hopefully can have a huge impact on the world. Um, to, the, to the point about technology, I kind of brushed over it there, but I'm a big believer that if we're spending 90, 95% of your life, you're spending 90, 95% of your day working, which is your work self, which is a part of who you are. And then part of the day, you're also online, which is your digital self, which is also a part of who you are. But neither of those personalities are your true self. You are someone different when you are with your closest friends, your closest family, or alone. And if we're not offering people an opportunity to show that self and be that self, um, I think that that's part of the reason we're seeing such an increase in depression. I don't have any data to back that up. That's just my thoughts. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's, I mean, there's, you know, there's multiple numbers that get battled around. I think that the scary thing at the moment is that there is a significant increase in the number of teenagers that are suffering from depression. And then additionally, you know, we're, I'm being very assumptive here, but we're generally a little bit more open than men, and men, when they have depression, suffer a lot more, and there is a higher risk of suicide within One that. Hour exactly. Which is really, really scary. So guys, it's okay, be emotional, share. Mm -hmm. um, so before we get into tech as a way of helping to go through and, you know, mindfulness and meditation and all of these different things, what are the other options that are out there to the public generally. Um, so in you're a psychologist, so it would be good to kind of get your take on, on what is available to someone who may be suffering. <coughs> I am a huge believer of face-to-face -face therapy. Um, as part of my education, we had to do um, 30 hours of self-discovery, which is therapy. And I went there and I'm, I'm fine, I'm chill, I'm cool. And after three sessions, I was in tears. I was working up old stuff. I was growing painfully. And it helped me so much, it changed my whole outlook on life. And I was thinking, if I went there feeling fine, what impact can it have to people who are actually not fine? And I've worked with people going through depression, and people working through um, eating disorders, and I see how they come from, like, why am I even here? I don't feel a spark of life. To a couple of sessions in saying, you know what, today I woke up, and I didn't feel like the world was gonna fall on my head and, destroy me so it's 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 a beautiful process and it, it helps growth and I think that is the best thing I would tell everyone if you, if you have like two cents left over don't buy a pair of shoes or that computer or something go and take three sessions with a psychologist of your choosing that brings warmth and growth into your life okay I'm making a note of that um Lizzie from your side you're obviously volunteering with the Samaritans what yeah. was the impact that you saw them having on people um, it's it's amazing. Like a, a, you know, it's got a reputation as a suicide charity, but actually, it's so much more than that, and it's really evolved into just a listening charity. Um, and it's basically a safe space for people to offload um, and then have information played back to them. And it's amazing how many people are like, "Thanks so much for the advice." It's like I haven't given you any advice. Like you've given yourself your advice, but you just didn't have a space. So you know, I guess what I would, from a non-medical point of view, want people to do is just try to be um, more involved in genuine human relationships. Because um, I think a lot of the impact that, you know, being on our devices the whole time has on us is very subtle. Um, and, you know, even just things like your self-esteem, if you're talking to someone and they check their phone, we all do that, but 
that that does take that makes me have a very small hit on my self esteem because it's like why are you doing that if you're talking to me like I'm mid sentence, and if we if we do that in our relationships and our friendships and our work relationships, again and again and again that is going to have a subtle impact that does build up I think. So just making keeping yourself in check to to do the right thing. Okay, so I'm going to move on now. We've done the the tech impacts on brain and the, we could go on and on and on. But what I want to know is how can technology help us? So um, Sylvia and, and Lizzie, you're both building apps that are there to do it. Um, and, and Nancy, I have questions for you that may need to roll VC brain, <laughs> like, just as a heads up. Um, but Lizzie, you know, let's start with Rank Mind. Yeah. Um, obviously, you're very, very new as an app and yeah. a startup. But tell us, you know, kind of what's the, the ambition with the app and have you seen any impact yet? Um, yeah, so what I love most about it, about technology, is that it's making very, you know, ancient traditions of stay, keeping your mind healthy, cool and accessible again. So Natalie mentioned the Headspace app, like that, that you know, they've nailed it and there's other apps doing the same in that space of, um, you know, yeah, technology's made, um, meditation which is not new and it's ancient you know accessible again so I guess what I'm trying to do and there are others in my space is trying to make you know self-reflection and writing down your thoughts or keeping a diary um, accessible again so it's as, as simple as that um, some of the impact I've seen is um, I've had a lot of feedback that just when you take the time to write a problem down the problem becomes a lot more manageable um, and I've seen that personally I had someone um, who was you know being really horrible to me and then I just wrote down like this person's being horrible to me and I've been like had a sleepless night about it like worrying and worrying and worrying and thinking oh my god they're so awful and then I just reduced it to one sentence and I was like come on like I can handle that like that is almost embarrassing if I had to show someone I'd be embarrassed that that had kept me up all night so so often just writing something down you know makes you realize that a problem can be more manageable and, and so in terms of kind of other types of tech that could come, whether that's stuff that we're seeing now or you know some ideas for what we could see in the future as well. How else could we see technology helping us? Oh, we are in such an exciting space and time right now. Um, for example, with our application that, that we're doing right now, um, we are able to penetrate people's lives in a very non-intrusive way that kind of assimilates into what they do naturally and just boosts it up a little bit. Um, by offering something on the ultimate comfort zone. Like, what do you take to the loop? Your cell phone, right? So this is something that is so natural, such a part of your life, that helping yourself with it is not going to be a threshold. It's not going to scare you, right? So you can do something fun like Headspace or My App Later. <laughs> These kind of things to just um, grow and become healthier. But if you go to virtual reality, for example, that would be great for phobias and anxiety and all kinds of stuff. So. We are at the cusp of revolutionizing therapy and being able to help each other on so many different levels. So it's, it's a beautiful time. And I think, sorry, just to jump in, but virtual reality, I'm so excited about as well because with mindfulness, like virtual reality is going to be the one tech space where you can't be interrupted. Like it's about being in the moment. So even when we're doing all these other things on our phone, ultimately, like you could still get a notification or you could still be distracted by another screen. This, like you're in the moment. So I think it's just like marries up perfectly with mindfulness. So I think talking about the, the future of tech, so Nancy, I did say VC brain. So sorry, <laughs> so I'll bring you back and then I'll send you back out again. Mm -hmm. You don't need to talk about it. But you know, what we talk about the opportunity for tech in this field, is there an opportunity that is exciting to investors, do you think, in terms of kind of mental health and that space? Or is it something that's a little bit too I don't know, we can't quite get there in terms of investment. Oh, absolutely. No, I think it's already very, I mean, so one of my advisors and I started a, what, a telegram group. This is actually how we met right before the panel about, we're calling it joy tech. I think that might have the wrong connotations for some people. So I like to more refer to it as happy tech, but it's definitely an emerging category from both an investor and a founder's perspective. So um, I've now been asked to speak on three different uh, panels on the wellness space as an investor. So they actually are collecting all of us who are really interested in it. And um, there are particular ones like Felix Capital has done some investments, True Start, um, Roy Sterling and PGF is personally very interested in it. I mean, if you, if you do your homework, you can find the investors that have either a personal tie to it, which by the way, investors do end up making a lot of the decision, although it is based on statistics and facts, it's also based on their heart. 
And so if you find one that really personally believes in what you're doing, that's a, that's a very strong, excuse me, connection point. Um, and in terms of the future, I, I, I see this as the next big thing. I mean, depression is even more and more mainstream in terms of talking about it. We're trying to make mental health cool again. I mean, these things are right on the cusp of being written about in the big industry, you know, industry reports, which will then tell investors, oh, we should be looking at that if they're not already. And by the way, can I just say, Calm is another one that is similar to Headspace, but it's a female voice doing the meditation. So if you prefer that, I check out Calm. They're, um, one of the co-founders is actually British as well. Good old Michael Upton. Yes, yes. Awesome, one of my advisors. Yes. Awesome. <laughs> Um, so Nancy, while I've got you, so you've gone from PC <coughs> to doing inspiring the full time, and you're a founder. All three of you are founders. But from again, just on the PC perspective and on your personal perspective, founders and mental health. So in the startup sense, this is a big issue because if you're the founder of a business, you literally feel like you have everything on your shoulders. Um, and there's a, a stigma about showing any sign of weakness, right? And, and being honest about your mental health to majority can be seen as a weakness, even though I think it's personally a strength to be that open. Yeah. Um, what have you seen in terms of founders and how they manage their own mental health, or, or even how you kind of each manage your own in terms of your day to day? So, Nancy, if we start with you, because I think you'll have an interesting perspective mm -hmm. of having seen both. How do I manage my mental health? So managing your own mental health as a founder and then how you've worked with other founders that are under those pressures. Yeah. I mean, it's it's a huge problem. It's, as I'm sure every founder in this room knows, finding time to do the things that matter to keep your mental health and physical health, are, it's very difficult. Um, in, my, in my experience, I think five things kind of contribute to being your, your best self. Sleep, which always goes as a founder. Nutrition, which is also difficult, especially if you're always on the go and you don't have a lot of money to pay for the for you know prep every day um, to get a salad, but it's cheaper to buy like a slice of pizza, um, and or just eat the free pizza that happens to be in your co-working space. Um, <laughs> physical, like finding time to run every morning or doing something, it's it's very difficult. And then your relationships and your passion. Hopefully, your your company that you're founding is your passion. So you got that one. Then you've got four others. A lot of people say that you can only do two of them. Um, I haven't figured out the perfect formula. I think it, as an investor, I've worked with startup founders and encouraged them not to email me after 12 a.m. because I want them to be asleep. I've sent them life coaches, business coaches that help with that. I'm actually working with another investor right now to create a packet for founders, like a resource packet. Like here are the things that you, tips and tricks to staying healthy. Here are some little, you know, some people that can help you in different areas of expertise around health um, in order to hopefully hack that a little bit. But it's, it's really, really hard. So what I've done personally is I've studied other founders that have done it all. Um, you know, they have a very regimented schedule that they stick to every day. 5 a.m. wake up, do the, do you guys have the seven minute workout app, workout app? If you have that, it's great. If you do two of those, shower, have your coffee and breakfast, and hit the email by at six, and are able to like get a bit of work in before everybody else. It sounds great, doesn't it? It's too early. <laughs> yeah, I mean, if I could do that every day, that'd be great. Um, it's a little unrealistic to start at 5 a.m., let's be honest, because we're all at events networking, probably until late the night before. But if you can do something to create um, consistency in your mornings, that actually can do a lot for the rest of the day. Oh, I don't want to talk the whole time, so I've got other tips if you want to ask me later. There you go. Yeah, if I may. Um, so I noticed that I was starting to get anxiety and like wake up in the middle of the night and go, oh, did I write that email? Or the investor hasn't written back? Or oh my God, like I'm losing a, a you know coworker or something like that. And I thought I have to practice what I preach. So every morning I do five minutes of breathing exercises and I do 10 minutes of meditation. And um, I, I went to hypnotherapy so that I stop eating junk food and, and sugars and everything. Oh, I that. Yes, yeah. it worked, it worked. <laughs> and I actually lost a bit of weight as well. <laughs> so it's a win-win, I've been eating healthy smoothies every morning and um, I make sure to shut everything off at nine o'clock unless something is really urgent and we have to like, produce something for the next day and that has really helped so I'm sleeping a lot better and my anxiety bouts are 
shorter. <laughs> can, I, can I just, before I forget, three tips really quickly. Breathe, the app teaches you how to breathe if you're not really into the meditation thing. Um, watch TEDx, this guy, Harry, H-A-R-I, his last name is Greek, I'm not gonna try and spell it for you guys, but it's called Superhuman and Cutting Out Sugar, huge. Okay, I, I have two points. I'm reading really Eating Without Sugar, and I'm going to ask your hypnotherapist. Yes, oh, yeah, me too, actually. Yeah. Um, Lizzie, you've got a slightly different story at the moment in that you're actually working on everything outside of your actual full time job yeah. at the moment, which. Um, yay! <laughs> yay! <laughs> how is oh my gosh, yeah. So, how are you actually managing that at the moment? Because I know, you know there's probably people in this room that might be thinking at some point, I want to start a business, but obviously you don't just quit your job and go and run off and do it yes. unless you've got a nice little padding of money, which I do not. Um, I'm asking for my own advice in like 10 months' time. So, you know, how are you managing right now? Um, well, my tip is really just to make sure that your downtime is actual downtime. I think a lot of people have fake downtime, um, where they're sort of like, I don't understand, I was so tired, like I was just watching TV for two hours last night, but they were like checking their emails, they were, or even like if you go, you know, checking an email has a knock-on effect beyond just like the two minutes it took to send that email, because you then are thinking about it before and afterwards. So that, you know, one minute of activity on your phone might have 15 minutes of activity in your brain. Um, so. And then you're just frustrated because you're like you feel like you've you've not worked properly and you've not rested properly. So just like segment your day properly. And when you when you've said to yourself that you're going to have downtime, make it actual downtime. Um, so that's what I do. And also, um, I don't stick to this all the time, but I have started mostly sleeping with my phone outside of the bedroom, which meant quite funnily I have to buy an alarm clock, um, <laughs> which I now have on my bedside table. Um, but actually, I found that really helpful because it means that I just get up and I go straight to the shower, I get my head thinking about what I want to think about for that day, and I'm not just like immediately like a zombie, like what emails did I receive in the night? So it just means that even if it's 10 minutes, it's just not like the first thing I think about when I wake up and the last thing I think about when I go to sleep, because that just means that your night is disrupted, you might dream about things. Um, so, so I find those two tips quite helpful. And airplane mode. Yeah. So, like if you don't get the alarm, put your phone in airplane mode before you go to bed. Because what I found, I got addicted to my phone, and I was actually, like, if I'm being really honest, I was going, there was a period where if I didn't wake up with notifications and WhatsApp, Facebook, um, Telegram, and my, you know, email, I was like, oh, nobody loves me. Mm -hmm. And then I had this, like, sad morning. Yeah. Nobody had texted me or all this stuff. And I realized it doesn't really matter. I just need to put my phone in airplane mode, do what you do, and then get on with it. That's a really good tip there. I'm going to open up to the floor. We've got a couple of minutes for questions. So does anyone have questions for the panel? Ahmed, hi. Hi. Um, we go. So I'm going to have a question for Ahmed why he's holding two phones. <laughs> Long story. Uh, <laughs> um, I'm just getting some Frank. No, just joking. Um, no. Um, how do you see VR helping with mental health? So, so let's uh, elaborate on the point earlier. So I know, Lizzie, you mentioned with VR that if the beauty will be that you know you just put on a headset and then that's it. Yeah. Um, but what other ways could we see that working? I mean, obviously VR, it's the anything really. Yeah, I mean, um, I've seen, I, I don't know the full details of the study, so I don't want to say these totally, I, I don't want to recommend anything that's not actually good, because um, a lot of them haven't been fully tested yet. But um, a lot of, uh, you mentioned phobias, things like exposure therapy through VR. Um, there's also a lot of for and against arguments going around at the moment for virtual therapy. Um, one of the pros for that is that um, some people actually feel like they could be more honest with a machine um, in, in a virtual um, reality experience than with another human, um, which, which sounds unusual, but at least you know that a machine is, you know, there is genuinely no judgment there and at the end of the day therapists even though they are trained they are still humans and of course they do make judgments um, so I think that could be an interesting area. I'll add to that I would love to see someone create VR programs for us to be our true self in the digital form so like a hundred percent of who we are that person that we are when we're alone but in a digital world and if you want to do that come talk to me because I will help you. <laughs> Um, I think there could be some amazing mindfulness, you know, just be still, be in nature. Nature is one of the health boosters, and being in London, 
has a big impact on one, even if we don't feel it and we're exhilarated by all the offers it has. So even if it's fake, like being in a forest with forest sounds or being underwater or something like that, I think could could really help you. Yeah. Are there any other questions in the room? Okay, I have one last. Oh, yeah, look at that. Oh, there's a sneaky hand at the back. <laughs> I'm too short. You have to stand up. <laughs> Hi. Um, mine is similar to the VR, but I wondered about maybe AR, so augmented reality. Um, the difference being that you put on your headset, you can still see the world. And I think that that might end up being bigger, quicker, if it can be, than, than VR and more mainstream. And I worry that <laughs> it'll just be bringing all of our notifications and all of the other stuff into our all of the time lives. And what might we, what should we be thinking about um, as <coughs> as technologists to not let that happen? <laughs> I don't know how to direct that to, but good luck. Um, well, to be absolutely honest, I haven't spent much time with augmented reality. I haven't looked into it, so I haven't really. I personally think interpersonal exchange, you know, having a chat therapy is better than nothing at all. Having reality, um, virtual reality therapy is better than chat. But being in person with someone, even if there is judgment, because these are the things we have to cope with and learn, and you know, it, it challenges you. So at the end of the day, even this is a bit old fashioned, I think. We are humans, we are mammals, we need contact, and just like physically sitting next to someone is healthier than being by yourself. So, I, you know, while adding is better than nothing, I think if you add too much without it being really healthy, then it still could be a minus. Can I? Sorry, sorry. You guys, I want to ask her. Oh, I, I, well, I was just going to say, I think AR, you know, the biggest example that we've had this year has been Pokemon Go. Mm -hmm. And that has had, you know, it's been, it, you know, a lot of people have been negative about it, but one of the positive um, impacts that it did have was getting kids outside. Mm -hmm. And so that's an example of where it could be used to have an impact um, on physical health, getting people running around again instead of being glued to their screens indoors, um, which can have a knock-on impact on mental health, obviously. Why do you think it's going to be bigger? then why do you think it's going to be bigger than uh, VR, faster? Um, because of some of the things that you're saying, I think it's more social. I think because you can still interact with people around you um, rather than being stuck to your screens. So it's got the roots in the real world. It's the layer on top of the real world. Just like when we were able to take mobile phones with us, we used them a lot more than when phones were stuck in the house and we had to go to them. What? Okay, actually I'll chat with you after. Never mind. Mm -hmm. And also, no one's invented a VR headset that doesn't make you look like a dick. <laughs> 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 the glasses make you look like I, I know. So. I, mean, I, don't, I don't know if Sam Kingston's in the room. Oh, she's waiting. That's <laughs> Sammy. Can you make that one of the questions for your VR panel? When do we all stop looking like dicks? <laughs> <laughs> Great, thanks. <laughs> I know you are. I'm looking forward to that. Um, I'm going to go. We might have to make it two, two questions. So, one here for you. Okay. AR are used to show doctors how psychosis feels and how schizophrenia feels. So it's increased the doctor's understanding of mental health as well. There, there are a lot of uh, simulations going on in the clinical field to help doctors become less stigmatic as well through VR and AR, particularly AR, and it's increased, and it's increased uh, care for psychosis a lot. And also for family members and friends, partners, for example, what it's like to live with phobia or anxiety or depression, you like to walk a few steps in the shoes of your wife or husband or child, say, oh, oh, okay, now I understand. Yeah, so help down make it more accessible to someone exactly. who's been lucky enough not to have had an issue yet. Um, I'm gonna ask one quick question, <coughs> because I know that there's probably one thing we haven't quite talked about, which is actually, how do you best support someone who has a mental issue. So I think it will make this 
a quick wrap up because we're going to have to wrap up quite quickly. I'm sorry, um, but you know, a quick thought. You know, how can we support others that are going through something? I'm going to go oh. down the road. So start with somebody and then work up. I think the first most important step is psychoeducation. Understand what is the um, disorder your partner, family, friend, member, whatever is suffering from, and then read through the symptoms. Try to read experiences or watch YouTube, you know, whatever you, you react best to, and listen to experiences. And the more you read about, the better you understand it to an, a certain extent. And then there are a lot of forums or um, or see a therapist with your partner. You know that actually couple focused therapy for depression is much more successful than just normal um, therapy because the partner is integrated and learns how to communicate and know how to react in this kind of situation. So talk and talk and ask questions, be open, be curious. Um, I'll talk about it from my personal perspective because I think that that is the right answer. Um, from my personal perspective, what really helped me were friends that wouldn't let me say no, that I don't want to see you, no, I don't want to hang out, no, I don't want to go out of my house, that like showed up at my door and brought me dinner and were like, we're hanging out. Um, because once you're in the deeps of depression, you don't want to see other people. So forcing, they forced me to have human contact, which always helped, but I didn't want to ask for help. So, um, and I, I'll say actually one more tip. One of my friends has done something really interesting. He said to me, because now I'm a sole founder again, which I said I would never do again, and here I am as a sole founder. And he said to me, I will be your support. I want you to text me, WhatsApp me, whatever, whenever you're having a low moment, it's not so much for depression, but it does, it, it helps. It's for any low moment. And he said, I will feel like a bad friend if you don't do it. Do you understand you're doing this for me? I will feel guilty and I will feel bad if you don't do this. So you're not doing this for you, you're doing this for me. And that switch actually works really well. So you can support your friends that are going through tough moments that way by saying, this isn't about you. This is about me feeling like I'm letting you down if you don't do this. Is the end um, I would just say listen and also don't, uh, you know, a lot of people are being more honest about mental health now, which is great, but that does mean that a lot of people are comparing experiences and sometimes, you know, people open up about something and then someone says, oh yeah, like my mum had that or my friend had that or me too, I always feel anxious. And it's actually just kind of like let people's experience be their own experience because um, it is still such an elusive thing um, and just listen. Yeah, Nancy, one, one last thing. This is on a different topic. I kind of want to make a plug. You can make a plug. I'm looking for an intern. <laughs> I'm looking to grow my team. So anyone who want, likes making other people smile. Yeah. Okay, no. cool. So anyone who would like to be an intern, knows someone who should be an intern, all details, Twitter handles, and everything are up there. So, so do kind of touch. On that note, will you please join me in a round of applause to Harold?